Good morning to our live audience and to any patients that may be listening to this in the future. I just want to welcome you to our first uh, 2022 Living Well with Diabetes class. My name is uh, Nurse Connor Stotts. I'm the Diabetes Nurse uh, Case Manager here at Indian Health Council. And just want to welcome you to this class, which is going to be a basic overview of what diabetes is, diet, um, physical activity, medications. And we have with us some special guests today, our dietitian and our physical activity specialist who I'll be introducing soon. Uh, but we have a whole support team here at Indian Health Council that we uh, that's here to support you for your diabetes needs. I uh, already introduced myself. I'm the diabetes nurse here at Indian Health Council. I can uh, meet people in the rooms, uh, educate about uh, medications. I also provide uh, home visits. And speaking of home visits, uh, a lot of the patients uh, at the council are familiar with Lorelai Legaspi. She won't be joining us this morning. But she's uh, our expert uh, certified nurse assistant who is amazing at home visits. But I guess we do have this morning is a uh, Wyatt Earhart, our physical activity specialist. And here's Wyatt coming on screen now. Hey, Wyatt. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wyatt. I'm the exercise specialist here at IHC. And then we also have Misty Faulkner, our registered dietitian. Good morning, everybody. I'm Misty, your dietitian here at IHC. And just want to introduce the team, just let everyone know that there is a team uh, behind the scenes that's working. Just if you have any questions um, during this live broadcast, if you look at the bottom of the screen where it's just scrolling down, it says submit your questions. You can click on that link and submit your questions anonymously. Uh, your name will be revealed uh, just in case you're concerned about privacy. And our moderator will give us the questions so we can answer it for you. Uh, so with today's topics, just as a general overview of what type 2 diabetes is, uh, we're going to be covering, you can see on the screen, what is diabetes? So there's a lot of questions about what is diabetes? Is it eating too much sugar? Is it not enough exercise? Uh, it's, what I've been told, a, a good description is it's a lifestyle disease. Um, Misty, would you describe it as a, was a storage disease? Yes, it's, it's a hormonal and it's really treated with nutrition. That's the first line of defense um, for treating diabetes. And I've had lots of conversations with uh, Misty in the past just about what diabetes is, how we can treat it. So she's going to be covering that soon in our next slide. But uh, other topics we'll be covering in today's Living Well with Diabetes is monitoring your blood glucose, uh, meal planning, um, adding activity, which our physical activity specialist, Wyatt's going to have a word on, medication, which you'll be hearing from yours truly, maintain your health, diabetes toolkit, and we'll also be uh, advertising our home health visits or public health visits. Good morning, everyone. So what is diabetes? So today I'm just going to cover a few things, kind of talk a little bit about what exactly diabetes is. And the main three ways that we really treat diabetes or, or manage diabetes is first, we want to make sure that we're checking our blood glucose. We also want to make sure that we're using diet and exercise, and then also taking our medications. So those are kind of the three main things that we're really going to talk about today. And so let's, let's get started. So what is diabetes? So diabetes basically just means that your blood sugar or your blood glucose, we kind of use those words interchangeably. They're not technically the same, but we just kind of use them interchangeably. Just means that your blood sugar is too high or blood glucose is too high. Well, why is it too high? Well, it comes from your hormone insulin. So our body makes the hormone insulin. And so what happens is over time, you know, various things start occurring through diet and it makes it harder for your body to make and use insulin properly. So then what happens without that insulin, then your body begins to, it just begins to build right in the blood. And so it just builds and builds. And then your body's not able to either one, use it efficiently. So your body is not able to use that extra sugar and take it out of the system, or it's just not producing it at all. And we'll talk a little bit about that with type one diabetes from the foods that you're eating. So your body's supposed to be using that sugar from the foods that you're eating and process that and use that for energy. And so there's a disruption in that. So that hormone has been disrupted. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. And so this just causes that blood sugar to just go higher and higher. 
your body keeps pumping out more and more insulin. And so there becomes an imbalance and we're not able to manage that properly and the blood sugar goes high. So what are some risk factors? So you might be wondering, how did um, I develop diabetes? What, what were some of the risk factors? What are some things that happened that caused me to develop diabetes? Well, some of the things is family history, right? So, um, you know, you might have a grandma or an aunt or a cousin or, you know, great grandmother, something like that. So usually there's a family history of someone else in your family, close blood relative being diagnosed with diabetes. Then there's also a lack of physical activity. So if you're spending most of your day on the couch or sitting down, you know, scrolling through that cell phone uh, at a computer screen, sitting at your desk, uh, you know, sitting in a class all day, you're then you're not exercising, right? So you're not moving around, your body's not burning any energy, you're not, you're not doing anything. So that's also part of a risk factor. So if you're sitting more than you're standing or moving, then that's a high risk factor. Also, if you're over the age of 45, as we get older, things start to break down, makes it more susceptible to us developing diabetes. Also, our ethnic background, right? So Native people, we have a higher, um, higher risk of developing diabetes. It doesn't mean that we can't combat it or that we can't prevent or delay it. Uh, African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, uh, Pacific Islanders, that all those groups are higher risk. So we want to just, you know, think about that. And then also, if you've ever been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So maybe in your first pregnancy, you were diagnosed with gestational diabetes, or maybe every pregnancy. So what that means is later on down the road, you have a higher chance of being diagnosed with diabetes sometime later on in your life. And you also increase the risk of your child developing diabetes sometime later in their life as well. So let's talk a little bit about the numbers. So everyone kind of, you know, is always asking, well, what, what's a good blood sugar number? Where, where, what should I be looking for when I'm testing? So when we're testing for, for blood sugar, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we're in a certain range, right? We're going to later on talk about A1C, so I can explain a little bit more about that. But usually most providers want your A1C, the measure of your blood sugar, to be 7% or less. Sometimes 8% or less is recommended, but that's usually for older patients or if you have other complications going on. But usually your provider and you will set up a number or percentage that you want to aim for. And then when we check our blood sugar before our meals, we want to make sure that it's between 80 and 130. So we want it to be in that range before we get up and have our first meal in the morning. If we're eating breakfast, then we want to make sure it's between 80 and 130 when we check that blood sugar. If it's higher, that, that's an indicator that possibly we had too many carbs the day before or some other things are going on. And then we want to check it anywhere from one to two hours after we've had our first meal. And that way we can kind of see what, how that food has impacted. So maybe you had a big pasta meal and you go to check your blood sugar and it's elevated, that'll be an indicator of maybe I can cut back on my, my portion or remove it from my diet. But we wanna keep that less than 180. That's usually the goal. So before we eat, 80 to 130. After our meal, less than 180 is what we're striving for. And so let's talk a little bit about what is diabetes. How does it actually how does it work, right? So on the slide there, you can see we have a healthy pancreas there. <clears throat> we have type one and type two. So what we wanna just kind of talk about is the insulin. So you see there in the arrow for the healthy, I have um, the pancreas there, and then it produces that hormone insulin. Remember we mentioned insulin before. So it produces that hormone insulin insulin binds or gets into the cell right it's supposed to connect to the cell like a key so if you put the wrong key in the door and you turn it it won't unlock it right but if you put the correct key in the door it will unlock it same thing with a healthy pancreas produces that insulin insulin's able to bind to that cell or connect to that cell unlock that cell allow the sugar to enter into that cell that's the healthy process then you're able to use that sugar blood sugar goes down, normalizes, 
keeps everything going, keeps the veins and vessels, everything healthy, right? So if we have type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, then it's a little bit different. So type 1 diabetes is actually an autoimmune disease. And so what has happened is the body attacks itself. And so the, when the body attacks itself, it's destroying that process, right? It's destroying that pancreas. And so what happens is you need insulin. You'll need to be, you'll have to take insulin every day for the rest of your life to manage that, keep you healthy and healing. And so your body just stops making that insulin. So you have to replace that or have a way of, of getting that. It does require insulin. Type two diabetes, however, little bit different story. And so what happens is your body is not using the insulin well, or it can't make insulin, you know, can't keep the blood sugar normal. So what it does is like, again, I saw it said earlier, it's just shooting out that insulin, the pancreas just, you know, creating it, creating it, creating it, and your blood sugar is going up and up and up. And the body is not able to, you know, the cell is not able to let that insulin in, right? It's not able to open up the door, right? So what happens is maybe you've got a few cells going there and there's just, you know, 20, 20 little pieces of sugar, if you want to consider it like that, trying to enter into that cell. And it can't because it's got too many, you got too much insulin, too many cells. It's not able to process, right? It's like a traffic jam, right? When we're going down the 15 and it's down to one lane, everyone can't go at the same time, right? We Only one lane, one car, right? Just only one. So that's kind of how that works. And over time, it just can destroy and damage things. And so we want to make sure that we're keeping that blood sugar again, 80 to 130, and then less than 180 after, after the meals that we've eaten. Okay. Hey everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about why is high glucose a problem? I'm going to relate everything just back to exercise because I am the physical activity coordinator here at IHC. Um, but just before I begin, I just want to say that um, it's important um, that everyone, you know, speaks to their primary care provider before you start an exercise program, you know, talk to them, um, see what kind of program starting out would be okay for you. Um, so first topic, hyperglycemia, which is high glucose and exercise. So as we may know, um, high glucose or hyperglycemia is when we have too much sugar in our, in our blood for our body to regulate. So when we start an exercise program or we're walking or involved in any physical activity, uh, the intensity of the workout may change the amount of blood glucose in our body. When the blood sugar is raised too high, it can lead to potential diabetic related health conditions. Um, maybe Connor can dive into that a little bit later. Um, and the general recommend health recommendations that suggested are anywhere from uh, 250 millig milligrams per deciliter or higher is uh, deemed unsafe to exercise. So it's really important to make sure that we're checking our blood sugar prior to exercise to see if it's in a safe range. Hope you don't mind if I jump in a little bit, Wyatt. Go but um, with uncontrolled uh, diabetes, it's kind of insidious as a disease. Uh, in the same manner as hypertension, hypertension's often been called the silent killer. And I think that uncontrolled diabetes is related in a way. I've spoken to a lot of patients in the past, really uncontrolled diabetes um, in 400, 500s, A1C, 14%. And an issue I have uh, discussing diabetes with them is that they say like, hey, nothing's going on. I've had diabetes for years, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, but if you look at our, our little graph right here, that diabetes is a disease with long-term uh, potential degradation of multiple critical systems. Um, think back if you have any family history with your own older uncles, grandparents, uh, how they experienced diabetes. And I see this a lot. People who tell me that they don't see any current problem with diabetes. Then I just relate, well, how did your grandpa or your uncle handle it? And you can see that diabetes can cause nerve damage, a peripheral neuropathy. How this leads to almost a sensation like your hand or your feet are falling asleep. It's been described as incredibly painful to me uh, with pain. 
uh, with pain shooting up your leg. Um, there's also damage that can be done to your cardiovascular system since the, uh, the excess sugar can damage the, the blood vessels, uh, which can lead to an increased uh, chance for stroke, as well as uh, damage to the blood vessels in the eyes, which, uh, which is why I recommend patients with diabetes see uh, an eye doctor once a year because there's potential damage to the blood vessels in the eyes. And just you can see just almost the, all the critical systems of the body are affected, uh, have increased chances for stroke, blindness, amputation, peripheral neuropathy, which is why we think it's just so critical just to control your blood glucose just through diet, exercise, and medications. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Connor. So yeah, uh, diabetes is a head-to-toe condition. Uh, definitely can affect all vital organs. All right, so, uh, so checking your blood sugar, it's really important to monitor your blood glucose. Um, Going back to exercise, just kind of my mantra I'm sticking with that today is uh, say you're completing an exercise program. It's important to check your blood sugar before and after you exercise to avoid potential health risk. Generally, if you're a type 2 diabetic, you should be checking your blood sugar on a daily basis. And especially when you're exercising, because um, not only will checking blood sugar you know, provide a consistent measurement of health, but it also shows how your body responds to exercise and how you may be able to prevent blood sugar fluctuations. So it's a good idea, depending on what type of intensity workout you're doing, if it's high intensity, maybe you're doing yoga, maybe it's something that's possibly de-stressing in your life. Um, it's a good idea to check before and after just so you can see how your body reacts and how it can change afterwards. Um, health guidelines recommend to not exercise if your blood sugar dips below 100 milligrams per deciliter and um, the safe range is anywhere from 100 to 130 is generally considered okay. Um, so make sure that we're, we're checking our blood sugar and making sure it doesn't go too high, too low during exercise sessions. Um, also, you know, we do provide blood glucose monitors here at IHC. So you're welcome to come and grab one if you don't have one. Uh, Connor, you have any other details for monitoring your blood glucose as a nurse? Actually, um. I'll be bringing that up in some slides later on in medications. We'll also be discussing some uh, devices yeah. that patients can be using. Okay. So yeah, so if you're type 2 diabetic, it's good to just monitor your blood glucose on a weekly, daily basis. And then especially if you come and see me and we do an exercise program together, um, checking before and after. So go ahead and move on from there. Okay. A1C. So earlier I mentioned A1C. I said that we want to make sure that it's 7% or less. And then um, sometimes for older patients or people have other conditions going on, sometimes your provider might set it at 8%. But we want it less than 7% for most people. And so what is the A1C test? Well, as you can see there on the slide, I have two, you know, two pictures there. One shows not that much blood sugar, right? So it shows the low A1C. So that's your red blood cell, right? And so kind of imagine it as, you know, like a piece of candy, right? And so there's a little bit of sugar on the outside, just a little bit of coating on it. That's normal. We want to have a little bit, you know, on the blood cell, it's going to have just a little bit. In, in fact, you should only, our body, if we were to drain our blood actually of all the sugar, we shouldn't have more than a teaspoon of sugar actually running through our blood. So that's kind of a fun fact. The other diagram there shows the red blood cell, but it's completely covered, right, with sugar molecules, completely covered with it. That's what we do not want. And so what's going to happen when your blood sugar is completely coated with those sugar molecules, right? When your blood blood cell is, your blood's going to be thick. It's going to be thicker. It's going to move slower. It's not going to reach the organs and other functions of the body that it needs. It's just going to run really slow. We don't want blood to be um, thick, right? We want it to be thin. We want it to be thinner. We don't want to be too thin. We don't want to be too thick, kind of like the three little bears. We want it to be just right. And so when we have that high blood sugar consistently, that means that our red, red blood cells are coated with that. Also might have some breathing issues going on too because we need those red blood cells to carry oxygen through our body, right? And so this measures 
for the past two or three months. That's what this test says. It says for the past two or three months, I have e either been, you know, eating lower carbs, watching, you know, having more water, doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing, or it's going to say, you know, I'm, I'm having a lot of carbs. I'm not, man, you know, maybe not taking my medication properly. It's going to give us kind of an indicator of what's going on in the body, right? And there's a bunch of other things that impact A1C, but really what you've been eating for the past two or three months, we can already kind of tell what's been going on in the body. And it doesn't, it doesn't come from, you know, last night you had a cupcake or three weeks ago you had a chocolate bar. This is consistently for two to three months, you've been having cake, you've been having, you know, fried foods, you've been having all of these different food items. That's what it's going to show. And also when we check your blood sugar, it's going to usually it's going to be running higher, right? And so usually your provider will do this test every three to six months or, you know, maybe less depending on how well you're managing your blood sugar with your nutrition, your exercise and, um, and taking your medication. And, and but we definitely want you to come in and get your A1C checked. That way, you know what's going on. You know your body best, right? And so this is a way for you to kind of validate and say, okay, yeah, you know, I, I've been eating really well. These things are working out for me. Or you can say, oh, you know, I really need to scale back. This kind of can help you, help you as a guide you, right? And then also help your provider and help us know as the DM team what's going on with you so that we can help you be your best, right? So that's what we want to make sure that we're getting that A1C checked every three to six months with your provider here at the clinic. Okay, so uh, this slide we're talking about treating high blood glucose. So if you see uh, the two veins here, uh, one has normal blood glucose, not as much sugar in the blood, and the other one has high blood glucose, so you can see a lot more sugar in that vein. Um, so when we have hyperglycemia or high blood Sugar, uh, you know, there's symptoms that you may feel depending on how high you're running. If it's uncontrolled, uh, some of these symptoms include increased thirst, uh, increased need to urinate, increased tiredness, uh, blurred vision. So it's really good um, ahead of time to make sure that you're prepared. If you feel those symptoms to have something ready to go, make sure you're checking your blood sugar so you know. Uh, make sure you're hydrating, drinking sugar-free liquids, and um, you know, definitely talk with your provider ahead of time so you have a plan, something prepared ahead of time. Uh, you know, if you take insulin, you may need to take an extra dose. Uh, make sure you have those conversations. But uh, generally, if you know, if you're maybe you've had type two diabetes for a little bit now, you can kind of understand how your body regulates itself. You might know um, what fluctuations you may experience, and um, it's very important to understand your body and know. Um, when you should be taking your medications, make sure you have that all regimen and in a routine. Oh, Wyatt, do you mind if I mention something about diabetic ketoacidosis or on the topic of high blood glucose? Yes, of course. Uh, so with high blood glucose, there's something called diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, TKA for short. Generally, this is mainly a concern for type 1 diabetics uh, because you're not producing that insulin. So then it will, um, in emergency situation, diabetic ketoacidosis may occur. But I have seen in real life examples, uh, our type two uh, diabetes patients are also experiencing a diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, so I keep throwing that word around. Essentially what happens is when your blood sugar gets so uncontrolled and the body's not getting that fuel that it needs, uh, what happens is it starts to break down components inside your body uh, to try and get fuel other than just the glucose like we normally would break down for our fuel and when it starts breaking down these other components in the body uh the after product of that breakdown is uh ketones and uh, acid and so our body likes to have a nice balance of acid and bases in our blood chemistry uh, but with diabetic ketoacidosis uh, and that breakdown, the uncontrolled blood sugar, it just gets thrown way out of whack. And so you start to see symptoms, um, people breathing faster. Um, that is because the body's trying to um, breathe out the CO2 to try and get that acid level lower. They're going to get a, their heart's going to beat a little faster. Another classic sign of diabetic ketoacidosis is a uh, fruity breath 
because that's uh, that's what the ketones smell like. So if you notice yourself or a family member with diabetes, uh, tachycardia, um, breathing faster, hypotension, fruity smelling breath, and really elevated past 240 uh, blood sugar, I recommend that that's not something um, casual. That's that's something that I recommend going to the emergency room for. Back to you, Wyatt. Okay, so the opposite of high blood glucose. So say, you know, we're dealing with a situation where you have low blood glucose, uh, your blood sugar dips uh, relatively too low. In terms of exercise health guidelines, like I said before, um, generally too low blood glucose to exercise is anything under 100. However, all bodies are different. You know, everyone regulates their blood sugar a little bit differently from one another. So uh, here's some of the symptoms and signs. If you're experiencing low blood glucose, you should be aware of. Um, if you're feeling sweaty, cold, you maybe have clammy skin, um, dizziness or tingling feeling, um, tachycardia, like Connor said, with the high blood glucose, but that's also can be experienced in low blood glucose, maybe a headache. Um, with lower blood glucose, what tends to be seen is changes in mood swings. So you might experience some confusion, some irritability all of a sudden. So it's, it's really important to, um, if it's too low, I'm sure Misty can provide some insight on some healthy nutritional options if your blood sugar is going too low on what to drink or what to eat. So I can leave that to her. Um, it's also important to, you know, check after 50 minutes, if it's still low, repeat that step, check again. After 50 minutes, it's still low, call your provider, check in with them right away. Uh, once your blood glucose rises, it, uh, eat a small snack. But again, I'll leave that to Missy, the dietitian, to kind of go into detail on how that can help um, bring your blood glucose back to homeostasis. Thank you, Wyatt. Yeah, so I want you to try, not, to do not have chocolate, okay? So if your blood sugar is dipped low, we don't want you to have chocolate. We'd prefer that you have a small glass of juice, about four ounces I put, so that's about half a cup, you know, just a little bit, a little bit of orange juice, and you can have that, keep it in the back of your fridge or something so that you have it for emergencies, or, you know, you can buy it where it's shelf stable, um, and then put it in the fridge after you've opened it, but have that on hand, or get the gel caps, um, we have the little, the glucose tablets here at the clinic, or the gel, have those on hand. You should have that in your purse, you know, um, in your home, you should have those. Or also you can do a little tiny tube of those little frosting, the little gel frostings that are in the bake, baking section at the grocery store. You could also get one of those tab. Those last probably about a couple of years in your purse, have something quick like that. Those are the best, the best things that I want you to use, not chocolate to uh, bring back up that blood sugar. Also, you wanna check your blood sugar to actually make sure that it's actually low. Sometimes um, we think that our blood sugar is low, but it's actually not as low as we think it is. So we wanna make sure that we're actually checking because it could be something else going on. If it's a really hot day, it could be some you know, dehydration things or other things going on. So make sure you actually check your blood sugar first to confirm that it's low, if at all possible and then go through those steps of having the orange juice or having the gel tablets the you know or the gel or having that frosting tube use those as a method of bringing back up that blood sugar and then once you have gone through that process make sure that if you're not going to be having a scheduled meal that you're having a, a balanced snack of you know some kind of little carb and some protein you know, peanut butter and celery or apple and peanut butter, that type of thing to tide you over until your next meal. All right. So please make sure that you're checking to confirm that your blood sugar is low, if at all possible. Okay. All right. So now that's kind of a good, um, good way of, you know, going into meal planning, right? So I love, love talking about food. I, that's my favorite, I'm a dietitian. So why, why did I get into this field? I love talking about food and we all know native people, we love to eat, right? Gatherings, birthday parties, holidays. There's always some type of food, lots of laughter, lots of good times, right? And so we can still be part of those things. And we just wanna, wanna make sure though that we are balancing it out. If we're taking insulin, we wanna make sure that we're you know, doing that consistent carbs throughout the day. If we're not on insulin, um, then we want to make sure that we're managing it with our nutrition first and not having a, uh, 
you know, having a, a spike in our blood sugar. So remember blood, anything over 180, we want to keep our blood sugar less than 180 after we've eaten a meal. Okay. So we don't want it to be spiking above that. We don't want to see twos, threes, 400, 500 blood sugars. Okay. We want to keep it less than 180. So if you come into the clinic here, you will see, let's see here, sorry. If you come into the clinic here and come see me, I really preach the plate method. I eat the plate method. I eat that way myself, my family, we eat that way. So it's the great thing about it. It's not for people who have diabetes. It's not for people who have, you know, special conditions or anything like that. It's for everyone. We all should be eating this way. It's really, really important. So the basic, you know, it's just a basic way. There's no measuring. There's no counting calories. There's none of that. It's just straight ease. Yeah, I mean, it's just easy. You just take that plate and you just fill up the little sections. You don't even have to have a divided plate unless, you know, you like it. But you just have a regular plate, a regular bowl, and you just want to make sure that you're putting half vegetables. Half that plate should be vegetables, but not just any vegetables, right? We want non-starchy vegetables. Well, what the heck is non-starchy vegetables? Well, it's all of our vegetables except potatoes, corn, hard shell squashes, and green sweet peas. Those can move somewhere else. The other half of our plate, we're going to cut that in half and we're going to do a quarter of that plate should be your protein. So that's your basic animal, you know, your chicken, your steak, your pork, your fish, your eggs, your cheese, your um, yogurt, plain yogurt, not the yogurt with granola and M&Ms and all that stuff in it, just plain yogurt. And then that's what we're going to do for a protein then the other quarter of our plate that's where the starchy starchy fruits and sweets and things like that sweet food starchy sweets that's where that goes and so that's your rice your pasta it's also beans tortillas uh fruit all those things we count as carbs and then those vegetables that i mentioned earlier that corn green peas potatoes and hard shell squashes we count those as carbs you can still have them keep them to a smaller amount of plate. We're not here to say what you can and can't eat. We're here to say we want you to have it just a little bit more balanced, right? And then my favorite part of the plate, first is the vegetables. My second favorite part is the healthy fat. You've got to have fat in your diet. You need that fat to help heal and repair cells. You also need that fat to help give you energy and to keep you full in between meals. So we want fat. Well, what's what do we want as fat? Well, we want healthy fats. Well, what's that? Beans. I'm not sorry. Beans, nuts, seeds. Um, we also have avocado oil, olive oil, fatty fishes like salmon, and also avocados themselves. All right. So those are just an example. So what I gave right now is just some examples of some things that go into those different sections. If you want more details, you have to come in and, and see me and we can sit down and go in a little bit more detail. But that's just the gist of it. Making sure that you're having vegetables, all meals. That's really the main part of um, eating better is having those vegetables. You don't like vegetables? Come learn how to cook vegetables. Come see me. We can teach you how to cook vegetables. Got some great recipes. And it doesn't have to be anything complicated. Just be simple. Maybe you've never had vegetables cooked a certain way. Maybe, you know, when you were growing up, vegetables were cooked to a mush. And so you think of vegetables as mushy and not appetizing, but there's various ways to make vegetables. And I want you to eat them. They're going to help give you energy. They're going to help you manage that blood sugar. Really important. So the plate, simple and easy, just making sure we're focusing on those four food groups if you want to use that word. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about some activity to your life. Uh, Wyatt again here. Uh, before I get going, I see that we have a lot of questions lined up from the audience. I just want to let everyone know we'll be addressing all those questions towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so feel free to ask as many questions you want about nutrition, exercise, physical activity, or anything diabetes related. And we'll make sure to um, get on top of that after the at the end of the presentation. Okay. All right. So activity to your life. I'm just going to kind of address exercise, physical activity and how it relates to diabetes and ways that maybe you can get, you know, more active and, um, you know, kind of look into the exercise programs that are could be best for you. 
All right, so activity and diabetes. So how does physical activity support diabetes? Uh, well, like we spoke about earlier, uh, exercise, physical activity, any high intensity, moderate intensity exercises can help with managing your blood glucose. Not only your blood glucose, but if you're someone who might have high blood pressure, that can help you manage your blood pressure as well, and also your cholesterol. Um, and it improves your ability to use insulin. It makes your cells a little bit more um, you know, less insulin resistant, so you can um, manage your blood sugar a little bit better that way. And our recommendation uh, for every week is about 150 minutes of aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise is anything that you're walking, you're swimming, you're running, anything where you're kind of expending energy and it's, you can breathe, right? So aerobic is you're breathing while you're working out. While if it's anaerobic, anaerobic is a type of exercise where you're sprinting and not using oxygen. So, you know, wind sprints, cycling sprints, that kind of thing is the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. Anaerobic is a little bit more challenging. So we recommend aerobic because it's something that's a little more light and something easier you can do on a weekly basis. So what are some types of activity? Uh, so like I said before, walking, uh, the weather right now is absolutely beautiful. Um, if you're able to, there's no excuse right now to go out and maybe get an hour walk in three times per week. Uh, that should be a good activity goal you can set for yourself. Um, Swimming is a good one as the weather starts to warm up a little bit. Maybe if you have a pool or if you have a local community swimming area, um, swimming laps in the pool is great aerobic exercise. And it's also low impact on your joints. So if you're someone who a couple months post surgery, either shoulder or knee, um, for sure consult with your provider, but it's something that would not provide a lot of uh, challenges for you or, or um, any issues with your joints or mobility. Um, and it's an efficient way to burn calories. Um, strength training is another type of activity. So this is a type of fitness exercise routine. Um, generally a regiment, you know, three sets of 10 repetitions is kind of a standard for uh, strength training. This is something if you've never, you know, done strength training before, I wouldn't suggest, you know, looking up a YouTube video and kind of hopping right into it. I would definitely try to consult with me if you can um, call, call the clinic, get a hold of me and I can help you set up a program if you want to build strength because strength training is really important because if we're able to build muscle that provides a good avenue for our sugar to go. Because if we're sitting for most of the day and we're not active, we're not building muscle, um, our sugar kind of sits and collects this fat. So, um, you know, building muscle, doing those type of workouts allows uh, an extra avenue for sugar to go towards. And also uh, fun games I have here, something maybe you're a little bit older, you don't, you're not interested in maybe a strength training regiment program, but you still want to enjoy yourself, go out and have fun. Um, pickleball is a really good one. It's kind of like miniature tennis. Uh, cornhole is a really good one as well. Um, and for fun games, just anything you generally enjoy to increase your physical activity. Um, my last thing for everyone today is motion is lotion. So I say it's a lot to my patients. Um, if you're not really moving around much, if you're sitting for eight to 12 hours a day with little activity over time, um, all our bodies are gonna decrease bone mineral density. So essentially just get weaker over time. The less you're active, the less resistance and less challenge your bones are put against. So over time, if we're more active and we engage in physical activity, our bones get stronger, our muscles get stronger, and we're able to be more independent in our future. The less we're active, the less independent you'll be later on potentially. So it's just good um, in terms of diabetes to help regulate your blood sugar, regulate other health conditions as well, and um, keep you more active for a longer period of time. I have to unmute myself. Uh, so my specialty is uh, educating people about the medications. Uh, before I do that, I just want to emphasize just how important diet and exercise are. I hear a lot from our patients um, that they get medications pushed at them a lot. 
And I do want to say that taking medications is extremely important, especially take them as prescribed by your provider. But I also just want to emphasize that since diabetes is a, a lifestyle disease, that lifestyle changes are extremely important. And so I just want to emphasize again, diet and exercise and medications. And so if we just go to the next slide. So there's different types of medications. The ones that we're mostly familiar with and myself included are the injections, which are usually insulin or there's other types like Trulicity or oral medications. The ones most people are uh, familiar with is metformin. Uh, something that they didn't even teach us about in nursing school is um, inhaled insulin. So I had to do some research about that myself. Um, inhaled uh, insulin. It is actually on the market. Talk to your doctor if you're interested in that. Uh, but from what I see, it's it's not very common. And then there's also uh, insulin pumps, which is recommended for people with um, higher acuity, people that have um, uh, more of a need for the diabetes to be controlled. Uh, generally, the guidelines are over 7%. Uh, there's more um, maintenance required for taking care of an insulin pump. But it has been shown to have a, uh, a better, stronger effect in uh, keeping your blood sugar under control. Uh, but with managing your diabetes with medications, let's see, be aware of drug interactions. So right there on the screen. And I think that's extremely important because uh, that's that's a major topic with my patients. Is It says right there, vitamins, herbal supplements, prescriptions. So I wanna focus there uh, with, the, with the vitamins and herbal supplements, talk to your doctor before you start taking um, vitamins or herbal supplements in conjunction with your medications because two things might happen. It might um, work cooperatively with your medications, in which case there might be an unexpected boost to the medications and drop in your blood sugar, which would then cause hypoglycemia, which would be dangerous. Or it might have the opposite effect and antagonize with the medications you're taking, and then it might cause your medications to not be as effective as you want them to be. So talk to your doctor before you start taking vitamins and herbal supplements with your, medic with your diabetes medications. Uh, with prescriptions, uh, this is really important because a lot of people ask, like, why why is metformin like always being prescribed by the doctors? Uh, metformin is actually one, usually one of the first uh, first line medications doctors prescribe uh, because uh, it has uh, relatively mild side effects compared to other medications. Uh, what it does is it tells your liver, and your liver is responsible for producing a lot of blood sugar. So your your liver is like pumping out a lot of glucose. It tells your liver like, hey. Calm down. Don't produce as much, um, you know, sugar, which thereby can help reduce your A1C. And it's also one of those medications that um, has extremely, almost zero chance of causing a hypoglycemia. It's one of the few that has that like very low chance, of, no chance at all of causing hypoglycemia. Uh, the concern with metformin is, um, and this is with a lot of medications across the board, with our kidneys. Our kidneys are the filter of our body. And so your doctor may um, unprescribe metformin if your kidneys start to, to get damaged, uh, which happens a lot with people with uncontrolled diabetes just because the sugar in their bloodstream just is constantly harassing their kidneys. Um, kidney damage and eventually kidney failure is one of the risks of uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, other common medications are sulfonylureas. Uh, the common name for those are glipizides. And, um, with the glipizides, those do have a chance for hypoglycemia. So that's why, again, metformin is one of the most common ones because of the extremely low chance of hypoglycemia. Um, other medications, the ones that I think a lot of us are familiar with is insulin. And so there's um, rapid insulin, uh, regular insulin, short acting, long acting. Um, I know with a lot of the doctors, we want to stick with the oral medications first and then see how those are going with the patients. And again, this is um, a custom talking to your doctor, seeing what's best for you. Uh, but with insulin, um, the two most common ones we see are the rapid and the long acting one. So what do you want to know with the rapid acting insulin is make sure that you're, you're eating food um, like shortly before or after you're taking the rapid um, insulin. You don't want to just take the rapid insulin and then just not eat your meal because that, that's probably going to cause hypoglycemia. Um, and a lot of rapid insulin, it comes with a sliding scale. And your doctor will, will discuss the sliding scale with you when it's prescribed. And 
um, if you want a nurse to come by your home or to educate you about the sliding scale and help you learn uh, further detail about your medications, how to take it, we'll talk about the public health visits later on in our slides. Um, but follow the sliding scale. It's going to be printed right there on the box as it's prescribed. Then there's long acting insulin. So that one, you don't have to, it doesn't have a peak. So it, it has less of a chance of causing hypoglycemia. And so it kind of slow burns and helps reduce the, the blood sugar over a longer period of time. And you want to take that around the, the same time period every day, uh, which is what we actually have there in the middle side right there, stick to a routine. Uh, some tips for medications. And this one, um, I'm constantly just, just telling the patients, take the medications as prescribed by your provider. Um, I have I have a lot of stories. If, if you ever want me to come for a home visit, I can tell you a lot of stories. And just one of the most common ones is um, people with uncontrolled blood pressure. I know it's not diabetes, but it's related. And one of the one of the main things that I help them do is organize their medications, get them on a schedule to take the medications as prescribed by their provider. And the, the medications they start to, they start to work because with insulin, with diabetes and hypertension, like I said earlier, it's kind of an invisible disease, and a lot of patients don't see the the long term risk that they're taking when they're not taking their medications as prescribed by their doctor. And on the other hand, with that risk, if you're if you're taking the medications too much, or let's say you're taking them in combination with something else, then there's the risk of hypoglycemia. Um, Let's see, prepare a travel kit. So if you're traveling abroad, just make sure you're taking your insulin with you if, if, you're, if you're on insulin. Um, one thing I can think of is if you're a patient here at Indian Health Council, uh, one time you can always call us. Um, my extension, you'll see it again at uh, the staff slide later on, is 5299. Call us if you're ever traveling and um, there's an emergency. I once had a woman, she lost her entire medication kit while traveling um, out of state. Uh, we're here to help you. And uh, talk to your provider about the side effects. That's with people, medication, with diabetes. We had a question later uh, we're going to discuss about hypoglycemia. Uh, diabetes is a very personal and um, almost, it is an individualized disease. And so just talk to your doctor. If a medication is causing side effects that you're not comfortable with, let's say um, GI discomfort, or it's causing you hypoglycemia, Talk to your doctor, see if the medications could be adjusted or if it could be changed to something that would be more to your liking, more to your preference. So maintaining your health. And so one of my favorite topics I love to talk about with my patients is something called diabetes distress. And so with diabetes distress, if you have me, but, and this is just a, a scenario. Let's say you just got diagnosed with diabetes or you've had diabetes for years. And you have the doctor telling you, don't do this, eat that, make sure you exercise, uh, make sure you check your blood sugar, uh, don't forget to take your travel medication. Just imagine all that information just coming at you all at once. I mean, I, I don't have diabetes, but I've seen firsthand people just, it's too much all at once. And that's actually a phenomenon known as diabetes distress, which um, can be related to or mistaken for depression. And so with diabetes distress, and Misty White, you can jump in if you want, but with diabetes distress, we always recommend small steps, moderation, tackling the problem in areas that you can handle, just rather than trying to tackle it all at once. And just to remind people, you know, you can see me and Misty and White on the screen right now, that there's a team that we're here to help you with. Misty's here to help you diet planning. White's here to help you with exercise need someone to come to your house and help you organize your medications and educate you about medications. We want, we're here to encourage you, and let you know that it's a lot of overwhelming stuff at once, but we want to help you just see that it is possible because I have seen, I've seen people with A1Cs of 14% and he even getting diabetic ketoacidosis. And in three months, I've seen people drop their A1Cs tremendously and it's possible. Another thing I just want to emphasize, and just sleep is very important because a lot of people, when I talk with them about their diabetic history, um, sleep, stress, these all have an impact on the way that your body um, produces or manages the glucose. Uh, so when you're stressed, your body's producing more glucose, which is going to cause a more uncontrolled um, A1C. And so just we always recommend uh, 
eight hours of sleep. Some people can handle seven. Um, I'm very soft. I need I need my full eight hours of sleep every night. So go on to the next slide. So with your diabetes tool book, and a lot of this, if you're a patient here at the clinic, uh, we can help you get your hands on. I'm, I'm just looking at the slide with you. You have a daily diabetes logbook. Now this, that is, in my opinion, extremely important. I think a lot of people miss out on it. One time, all I did was I had the patient just start to fill out uh, her daily diabetes logbook, and we were able to, to almost customize a plan for her with, um, with her diet. Um, and we saw tremendous success in just using daily diabetes logbook and making almost a custom plan. Uh, so there's an insulin pen. Uh, if you're on insulin, you'd have an insulin pen. That's number two and seven. Number three right there, that's your oral medications. Um, so with your glucose monitor, um, so you can get one prescribed by the clinic if you're a patient here. Um, I understand it's extremely painful to poke yourself and to, uh, to check your blood sugar. Some of, you, some of you are tough. Some, some of you might say it's not that painful. But for me, like part of our training, I had to like poke myself, checking my blood sugar. And I, I understand why people don't want to do it. But I do want to emphasize that it can be incredibly useful. And it's pretty important to, to monitor your blood sugar. Just see how is the food, how is your meals affecting your blood sugar? What is your blood sugar? Are you, are you getting too high that you need to have the sliding scale insulin? It's important to check your blood sugar just for a variety of reasons for managing with medications. Uh, making that custom plan with your doctor and just like uh, how you're going to manage it after meals and just tracking your progress. It, it's really encouraging just if you've been treating your diabetes for a while and you see that there is improvement, you're just looking through your blood sugar monitor. Uh, it's it's tremendous just psychologically for that. Uh, we also have, I see number five, there's a diabetes bracelet. So let's say there's ever an emergency situation, you let the emergency personnel know that you have diabetes, which is important for them. Uh, then number six and eight is more diabetic information, uh, diabetic medication. Now, this slide, this is uh, for advertising myself and my certified nursing assistant, uh, Lorelai Legaspi. We have uh, public health visits that we're offering to our patients who uh, live on the consortium. Um, so a lot of people, they ask us, what do you do at the home visits? Uh, well, you can see they're on the screen. We can do vital sign checks. Um, so we can check your blood pressure. We've been to people's houses before where their vital signs were just um, tremendously out of the normal range. And so we've we've had to help them get emergency uh, services to help them uh, multiple times. Just in the last six months I've been here just checking their vital signs. We can help you schedule appointments. So um, if you're ever having a hard time getting a hold of the front desk and you want to schedule a diabetes appointment with your provider or you want to schedule an appointment with uh, Misty or Wyatt for consultation, uh, we can help facilitate that and make it easier for you. And then we can do blood sugar checks, um, medication refills, uh, medication education. I'm a nurse, I can educate you if you have any questions about your medication, such as the sliding scale. Uh, we can get, help you with your referral follow-ups. So a lot of doctors, they'll give your referrals to endocrinologists, neurologists. We can help you um, get in contact with the referral office. Uh, education, and we can do a lot more. And then I just want to just put everyone's uh, faces on the screen again. Just remind you that you have a support team here. Uh, you have me. My extension is 5299. Uh, you have Lorelai, uh, my certified nursing assistant I mentioned earlier. Uh, she is a real treasure. She, she's pretty well known on the reservation. If, if you ever want someone to encourage you, if you ever want someone to just, uh, just to help you and just be a hand, Lorelai Legaski right there, her extension 5384. We have our physical activity specialist. He's always willing to go one-on-one, -on -one, uh, Wyatt. Then we have Misty Faulkner. Um, I've talked to Misty a lot in the past. She is like a treasure trove of information about diabetes and dieting. She, I'm, she is a resource that I cannot emphasize just how important. Because with treating your diabetes, diabetes isn't just me pushing medication. It's not just exercise. It's, it's not just diet. It's it's a team effort, and we just want to let you know that you're not alone, that we don't want you to just feel overwhelmed. But you have Misty, Wyatt, Lorelai, and I, we're here to help back you up. And that would be the end of our slides. And are you ready to take the questions, team? Yes. Yep. Yep. Let's see. Uh, David, and David's our moderator. David, is it only these two questions I see in the chat?
I'm going to take that as a yes. And so I see the two questions. Uh, the first question is uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Is it in our bloodstream or question mark? Uh, and so with diabetic ketoacidosis, and maybe Misty, you can jump on here. There's something called the keto diet, and I'm not going to recommend yes or no for the keto diet. That's that's something you should talk to the RD about. Uh, but with the with ketoacidosis, that's when your body starts to break down the fat. And so because it's not getting that sugar that it wants. And so when it starts to break down the fat, it produces those those acids. The acid can create uh, an imbalance, which your body really does not like that imbalance. And so is it in our bloodstream? Uh, yes. Yes, it is a, an acid imbalance in your bloodstream, which, which can be an emergency, which is why we recommend going uh, to see emergency services with a diabetic ketoacidosis. The next question was, what is considered low blood sugar? And so um, there is an across the board number that's recommended that uh, when you check your blood sugar, 70 is con uh, below 70 is considered low blood sugar. Now, however, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, diabetes, um, it may vary from person to person. So I'd recommend also um, talking to your provider, like what is low blood sugar for you personally how do you experience um, low blood sugar? So Wyatt mentioned the symptoms earlier, uh, fatigue, uh, mood swings, looking pale, tachycardia, uh, which is a fast heart rate. I've had people who their blood sugar was 100 and they're experiencing hypoglycemia. Uh, so even though the, the across the board, the national average where it says seven below 70 is low blood sugar, it's also something that you need to talk to your doctor about and just also remember that if your blood sugar gets too low, uh, too fast, so let's say you're in the 300s and then you just tank it, and even though it's not below 70, uh, your body could react with hypoglycemic symptoms there as well. So again, just 70 is just across the board, below 70 is the across the board definition of low blood sugar, but talk to your doctor, find out what it is for you. Do you have any comments, Mr. White? No, I think that covered it. Okay. Do you have any more questions, David? Then we're waiting in the chat. That's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, thank you for joining us for our first uh, 2022 Living Well with Diabetes. Again, I'm Nurse Connor. You can see the rest of the team on the screen. Um, this is going to go on to our library later if you want to listen to this again. We're going to try and hold these once a month. But it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.